Hello and welcome to The Warshipologist. You're watching a channel devoted to the history of USS Wasp CV-7 and we'll look at her story through photographs and other historical documents. In the previous video we looked at the design of the ship and the compromises that had to be made to stay within the limits of the Washington Naval Treaty. In this video we're going to look at the ship's construction at the Fall River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts. Before I begin, I want to mention that while I've been making this episode, the wreck of CV-7 has been discovered by the deep sea research team on the research vessel Petrel. So this is amazing news, not only to view the ship's current condition 4,000 metres under the ocean, but more importantly to view the wreck as a memorial for the 193 men who made the ultimate sacrifice for their country. The images retrieved by the Petrel will be a great help in telling the story of the WASP. September 1935, Howard Hughes sets the world air speed record at 334 miles per hour. Hitler enacts the Nuremberg Laws depriving Jews of German citizenship. And President Roosevelt dedicates the Hoover Dam. On the 19th of September 1935, USS Wasp was ordered from the Bethlehem Steel Corporation and would be built at the Fall River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts. US Navy pre-war carriers were all built on the East Coast. Langley at Norfolk, Virginia. Lexington at Quincy, Massachusetts. Saratoga at Camden, New Jersey. And Ranger, Yorktown and Enterprise at Newport News in Virginia. Before we look at the construction of WASP, I want to talk a bit about the Fall River Shipyard. Now, you could do a whole series of videos on the history of the yard, but I just want to delve into a little geography and history to give you a feel of the area where WASP was built. So we have the town of Quincy, about 10 miles south of Boston. Here you have Boston Harbour. Then you have Quincy Bay. And then the Fall River. The yard is here on the east shore of Quincy and across the river is Weymouth. You can cross the river by road bridge and all the ships built at the yard would have to go through this bridge in order to get to the open sea. On the east bank of the river is the power station that in WASP time was called the Edison Power Station but today it's called Constellation Energy. On the southern point of the power station you can see a large electric pylon this is present in most of the ship launch photos at the yard. If we look at the yard itself we can see the three slipways where the large ships were constructed. These are slipways number 10, 11 and 12 right to left. I'm not entirely sure which slipway WASP was built on so if you, if you have any idea or you know then let me know in the comments below. Once the ships were launched they were moved to the wet basin here. This is the Fall River Road Bridge that was completed in 1936, the same year that WASP was laid down. Unfortunately it was demolished in 2004. This is a great aerial shot of Hancock CV-19 in the wet basin. You can see the bridge and if we look at this picture taken in the 1980s you can see that they've added another basin to the north. Here's the Hancock leaving the yard through the drawbridge. Unfortunately I don't have a picture of Wasp going through this bridge but you know you can get the idea by looking at this picture. In this picture you can see the Argentine dreadnought Rivadavia fitting out in 1912 and in the background you can see the previous swingspan bridge that was built in 1904. So ships have been built in the Quincy area since 1696. I think the first ship launched was the Ketch Unity. But the Fall River Shipyard at Quincy Point was established in 1901 by Thomas A. Watson, who was an inventor, and he worked with Alexander Graham Bell, the guy who 
invented the telephone. And the first words spoken on the telephone were, Watson, come here. So that's, that's the same guy. He started the, the shipyard. Here's a, here's a map of the site from 1892. And you can see how the land was changed. Uh, Howard's Creek or Haywood's Creek, I've seen it named different ways. Uh, this is on the left, and this was filled in from the start, but Bent's Creek on the right was used as a wet basin where ships were moved for fitting out. The Bethlehem Steel Corporation bought the yard in 1913 for $4.8 million, which is worth about $122 million in today's money, uh, and that added to the numerous yards they had across the U.S., and expanded their shipbuilding capability in the Boston area. It was the second largest shipyard by workforce in the US, and in 1943 it employed about 32,000 people. So a total of seven US Navy aircraft carriers would be constructed here at the Fall River shipyard. So those were the Lexington, the Wasp, another Lexington, another Wasp, the Bunker Hill, the Hancock, and the Philippine Sea. Okay, so now we're a little more familiar with the Quincy area. Let's, uh, let's start to look at the photographic evidence of Wasp's construction. Okay, here's the earliest photo that I've managed to find of CV7. Uh, it's July the 8th, 1938, so that's over two years after the keel being laid. So it's July the 8th, 1938, it's actually a Friday, so this is a Friday. Um, we're looking east across the Fall River, uh, and you can see the electricity pylon in the top left of the picture. Judging by the shadows, it's either a little overcast or the sun is right overhead, it's, it's difficult to tell. Uh, one thing's for sure, there's not much activity going on, which makes me think that this is their lunch break or um, coffee break or something. There's a handful of men in the picture, and most of them are standing around talking. So it definitely has that Friday feeling. So there's less than a year to go before the launch, and it looks like they're in the process of building up the hangar. At the forward end of the ship we can see the main deck and the partial construction of the forecastle deck on top. In the middle of the forecastle deck is a large hole which has been cordoned off to minimise the risk of some poor soul falling down. You can see the top of a ladder coming out of the hole. This seems to be the way to access this workspace. If we check the builder's plans you can see that this will be a stairwell uh, that goes down quite a few decks. Staying with the plans, uh, you can also see to the right of the hole is the barber shop on the main deck. Here's a picture of the barber shop on Yorktown, taken in 1937. I would imagine it would be quite similar to that of Wasp, but probably this one's a bit larger than the one on Wasp, uh, judging by the builder's plans. Um, it also gives you a good feel for the interior of the ships of this period, very austere environment. Forward of the hole we can see a trapezoid shaped area. If you check the plans, this is shown as the windlass room. So this is where the motors would drive the winch to pay in the anchor chain and also power the capstans which would take up the slack from the mooring lines. Either side are quite large passages leading back to the stairwell. If we look at the hangar structure, you can see how it's just a frame welded to the hull. This was a big design difference from British carriers, which had the decks up to the flight deck as part of the hull. This was the strength deck. So the hangar space was 17 feet high, and this made it possible to store spare aircraft by suspending them from the ceiling. This is another reason why US aircraft carriers had such large air groups. There are two ladders leading up to a scaffold on the ceiling level. I think I'd be terrified climbing up one of those flimsy ladders. You can actually see a man perched on the centre line girder. I've no idea what he could be doing. I'm sure he needs to be there. 
Another interesting thing about this photo is the asymmetry of the hanger. You can see on the left of the picture the line of the hanger is straight whereas on the right side the line is curved. This is a good illustration of a new feature for US carry design at the time where the weight of the island on the starboard side was offset by building out from the water line on the port side. In previous designs the island was counterbalanced by extra ballast on the port side. Looking at the crane way over the ship you can see two gantries one above the other. They slide backwards and forwards picking up material from the dock and dropping it anywhere on the ship. The hull is surrounded by its terrace scaffold. This is where the outer skin of the ship that had been cut and shaped on a press would be welded onto the framework. On the main deck at the bow there's a man working at a small workbench. It looks like he's obscuring another man. You can just see another leg. Um, they have a power cable or airline for their workspace. Uh, and strewn around the deck are steel girders that have been cut with precision. Looking back at the barber shop on Yorktown, you can see how the girders had large circles cut out from them in order to allow pipes and conduits to pass through without impeding the deck height. On the bulkhead behind the girders, you can see lots of notes and marks made on the surface. I imagine these are guides for the welders. I think that about wraps it up for this photo. If you have anything to add, um, you can let me know in the comments below.